So, um, uh, um, we, we last did a state of the mesh uh, five years ago, <laughs> and uh, thought it was about time for another one. They were going to be a yearly thing, but uh, we skipped a few years there. So, uh, I want to do a general update on our status and uh, some of the problems uh, we're working to resolve. Um, this is a map, a screenshot from today, it's uh, 1,344 installs, so we're, we're still uh, growing. But uh, it, you can tell from the map though, we're very concentrated in, in this one area of Brooklyn and downtown, whoa, I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking up, and uh, downtown Manhattan. Um, the, the installs are at uh, around five per week now, and uh, it's, we're not really increasing our growth anymore. We we're, were exponential for a while, but we've, we've flattened out to five a week. So um, one of the biggest problems we're having at the moment is rain. Um, this never used to happen with our original installs. We were using uh, light beams, and that's all five gigahertz. And uh, they're very good in the rain, but we... Um, started using these 60 gigahertz antennas because they're, they're very fast and they're cheap, and, uh, but they don't like the rain. So uh, now we're having a lot of problems when it rains. Um, the solution to this is to uh, not do such long links. So we're gonna try and have uh, more hops and um, shorter links and, um, and only, use, only use the very best devices that are longer range less likely to fail. Uh, the other thing is, of course, um, more fiber leases. <laughs> That's an expensive option, but uh, we're talking about that as well. And uh, you can join us on Slack if you want to get involved with that. There's a lot of talk. This is Daniel's um, design uh, for how to improve the links in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, in um, Manhattan, we've got a really high density, so we, when we don't have so, so much failures, and um, like my, my link never goes down, and, and uh, yeah, this, Brooklyn's having a lot of problems at the moment. Um, one thing that's uh, changing is um, we're getting a huge number of inquiries about full buildings, and that's um, that's taking up all of my time. Like I, I spend a huge amount. Of hours on this per week, uh, doing site surveys, talking to construction people, talking to architects. It, it's it's um, it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, eventually, we'll have to take on a, a contract, uh, get a contractor or a full time position to do this. But um, but for the mesh, it's great. Uh, if we can uh, start doing these buildings, and um, we, you know, we, we help a lot more people, and it's um, a lot faster to to do a whole building than to, to do a single apartment. So um, you can see the, the inquiries we're getting at, at, from the, in the Bronx or way out in East New York um, and in Staten Island. Uh, so that, that could really increase the coverage of the mesh. Um, with, uh, <clears throat> with the big buildings, you deal with uh, management companies and uh, this uh, three that we've been dealing with mostly, it's um, Olive Branch Catholic Charities, which is this area. And we got uh, four buildings from them. And uh, it's also Fifth Avenue Committee in Brooklyn. We've got two buildings from them so far. We'll probably get some more. That's HPD. And uh, there's um, NYCHA, which um, I don't know if these will happen. It, it's so slow with NYCHA. And, uh, they're kind of on hold, the, those, those two. One of the buildings, um, it's coming off the top uh, well, One of the buildings which I thought we would get, uh, we didn't get, uh, we lost the bid on it. But, and when, when we do a bid, we do it at cost, so nobody can really um, underbid us. <laughs> like, um, but what happened was uh, the, uh, I know this uh, from talking to them. The, the person that did win the bid um, got uh, FCC money, and so they they basically doing it for free and getting money from the FCC to do it. So we, we lost that bid, and 
I want to talk more about this, uh, the FCC um, Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, we're very unusual uh, for a nonprofit in that we're self-funded. Like most nonprofits, survive on grant money, and uh, it's it's many years since we've had any grant money. And we're, uh, we have um, subscriptions from members, and that's that's how we we're self-funded. And uh, we've got a very healthy um, bank balance. Jason will talk about this later. And uh, um, yeah, but we, we haven't had grant money in many years. So um, yeah, on, on the one hand, it's, it's great because we, you know, we can keep going no matter what. And we, we're not on, under any obligations, grant obligations, which sometimes are very strict. Um, but we're, we're losing out on millions of dollars <laughs> by that. We're not uh, participating in this grant money. Thing. So there's a FCC affordable connectivity program, and um, I, I've spoken to other community networks that have got this, and it's not hard to get, but you have to register as an ISP, which um, we're, we're basically not an ISP. Like if you look on our website, it never says ISP anywhere, and um, it's a thing we uh, talk about a lot. Is that you know we we're not. We just don't have the ISP business model, and we don't think of ourselves as an ISP. But I think we can get get this um, get into this program by working with a separate um, affiliate company that can basically uh, collect the the money for for the um, for the installs and uh, uh, do the billing for the installs, and then get the um, uh, ACP money. And uh, we're, we're talking about that with the board at the moment. But I, I, think, um, I think we'll come up with something we can all agree on and uh, it will make it much, much easier for us to get uh, the bids on these buildings. Um, one weird problem <laughs> we had, there was a uh, purchasing error and uh, we're way overstocked on equipment at the moment. We've got to figure out how to get rid of 150 light beams and... Uh, 30 AC mesh pros, the, the access points we stick on the light poles. They're, they're $200 each, so we've got like $6,000 worth of these access points. And uh, we've got a, a whole bunch of uh, rabbit ear access points as well. Uh, we, we're, we're putting in place uh, things to stop this ever happening again. And, uh, but uh, if you need some gear, let us know. We, we've got way too much. It's the racks of gear there, you can see. Um, another problem is working with the city. Um, we've got a really long history of trying to work with the city, and it's like uh, about half of our our uh, application time and, and, and conversations on Slack are, are, have been about how to work with the city, and there's been so little results from that. We've got two rooftops, and that's it. it it's like a huge amount of effort and uh, very little um, to gain from it. Uh, Governor's Island was one project we, we spent a lot of time on, and uh, the, the city just, they're so cheap, like they, they, wanted, they wanted, wanted us to uh, put Wi-Fi across the whole island for $10,000, like, you know, it, it was, it was, this was like a half a million dollar project, and the budget was $10,000. So, um, sorry? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and speak up. So, um, and we did, we still put it a bit and we didn't get it. Uh, but yeah, that, that was one of the early ones. And uh, NYCH has just been um, so slow to work with. Um, you know, we, we got Vernon, that took us two years, and, and everyone that worked on that went crazy, and uh, a, lot, a lot of people just left the mesh <laughs> and, uh, that were working on it. Um, it. It would really send us all insane. It, it wasn't a wasn't a pleasant experience. But Vernon's proved to be um, a great asset, but um, yeah, w way too much time has been on it. And um, we, we did an RFP for the city, and again, spending a lot of effort on it, and then uh, the new mayor came in and just scrapped the RFP. So we, we, were, we were going to get about half a million dollars worth of funding for that, and it, 
and we won it. <laughs> and we were approved and everything, and then the mayor just cancelled it all. And um, what he did instead is, is this big Apple Connect. It's a, it just seems like a scam. Um, he's paying cable companies $30 a month to provide free cable TV to NYCHA residents. This isn't internet. He's paying them to provide cable TV, like um, this obsolete technology. Uh, so the, the cable companies are getting $60 per apartment from the government to provide cable and internet. It's just a scam. And I think we're locked out of providing internet to NYCHA residents now. Uh, so the, the other side of uh, the city is um, HPD, uh, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, which is um, uh, Grand Street's a part of that. And it's a much, much easier organization to work with. Um, the, the, there's man, um, separate management companies uh, that look after these buildings, so you're dealing directly with the management companies. You're not, you don't have to go through a bureaucracy. And uh, you can get things happening, happening much quicker. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're much, having much more progress with uh, HPD buildings. So um, the, the, the building thing is really taking off now. So we've got uh, about five underway. And I think generally we're moving from doing these single apartment things to doing more buildings, but doing more full buildings. Uh, even um, like in, in Alphabet City, we just um, started doing a full building install in a, like a 30 apartment building. Yeah. Um, whereas we used to just, you know, do one, one apartment and then a year later we might do a second apartment or something. But you know, now we're getting the, the full building requests. There's a, I put a, a page on the website where you can um, enter to do, um, which gives you an email address and instructions on how to apply for a full building install. So um, this is starting this week, uh, Sunset Park Library. Um, we're just starting with a roof there, and it's going to be the major hub for the area because it's the, it's on a bit of a hill there. It's the tallest building for, for like a, a mile or two in any direction. So that's going to be the major hub. It's got much better line of sight than the supernode, so we're going to do a very fast connection to the library and then use that as the main hub there. And we're doing a building just, um, just a block away on 50th Street. Um, yeah, that, that's the library, and uh, this is the building on 50th Street. Uh, we're doing all of the apartments in there. It's a renovation. And uh, one thing we're do doing with these new buildings is trying to get the, um, the contractors to do all the, the conduits as well. So in this, all we're doing is dropping a cable down, plugging it in and uh, at both ends, and, and we're done. So it's, it's going to be um, a pretty quick install. I think Sean's going to do uh, most of it, and uh, it's, um, I think it's, uh, it's around 30 apartments there, I forget the exact number. Um, this, is, this is a huge one, which uh, we, uh, we, uh, um, in, um, in the Bronx, and uh, I've got to start um, getting uh, the, the equipment together to, to do this, and uh, We've got to start talking to the um, electrical contractors there as well. But this is um, 230, 13 apartments in the Bronx. So this, this is a definite one. It's going to be our first uh, building in the Bronx. So, so it's quite exciting. Um, so uh, thank you. <laughs> That's it for me. And, uh, yeah, I, I put all these clapping people there to encourage you to clap. <laughs> Um, so, any questions? You had a question. Yeah, I think I'm. Okay. So, you mentioned earlier about our not having any grant funding in the past couple of years. What is our major restriction to that? Is it one of qualification where we don't meet the requirements because we're not an ISP? Is it we're just not trying? Is it. Yeah, it. it yeah, it's, we're not trying. Um, we. 
we've put a lot of effort before. It's, it takes a real lot of effort to apply for grants. And, um, and it, yeah, people got burned out on it. We, we don't really have anyone working on it at the moment. Got it. And I know there's a lot of infrastructure has become a buzzword at the moment, so I know there's a lot of money around that we could be getting if we um, worded what we're doing correctly. And, uh, you know, yeah, we should be applying. OK. Any other questions? Yeah. I guess to follow up on that question, um, I know that grant writing is a pretty uh, intensive process. I've um, been with organizations that had like a full-time, at least one full-time grant writer, and this is like for a small farm. Um, I know that we um, have, there's a possibility of some AmeriCorps volunteers. Um, is that something that they could do? Is that like something that one of those volunteers could be put on? Um, we don't have any, we, we had one person that accepted and then she canceled. Oh. We don't have any, any, um, yeah, no, yeah, nonprofits generally have a full-time person just writing grants. And, uh, and like I was saying, most nonprofits are geared towards getting grants, like that was their main objective. <laughs> and it kind of twists their mission a lot. Mm -hmm. And at least how we're very pure in what we do. We're just connecting people and we're not spending time applying for grants. But if, if we did get infrastructure grants, we could get a lot more fiber leases and, and uh, expand that way. Is the goal of getting grants just to fund those projects, or is it a general cash flow issue to pull money into funding projects that we already are doing? Um, well, the, the, the grants are usually tied to a specific thing, like the a ACP, Affordable Connectivity Program. It, you, you just get $30 for every person you connect, 30 a month. Um, there's other grants where you, you know, they're tied to specific projects. And um, th there are some grants that have no strings. Um, I, f I forget, um, so Vazor's ex-wife, she, she, um, she, she has large grants with no strings attached. And, um, but I, I think it's, it's a discussion we need to have before we apply for the big grants is what we do with it. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions? Um, uh, Jason, do you want to? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is the, the numbers are a little small. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is just kind of looking at the general numbers of the organization. We uh, split, we reorganized, we have a, uh, an attorney on our board name now named Ian. What's Ian's last name? Matthews, Matthews thank you. Hey, Daniel. Um, and uh, he suggested that we uh, split our main organization into two parts for liability reasons. So we have two organizations, two entities now. One is our corporation, the other is the LLC. And so we're trying to focus all our transactions on the LLC. This is just a few columns. One of the one shows the corporation on the left, LLC in the middle. Really, this third column here is our total uh, net revenue. Our average monthly net is just over $5,000 and our bank account on the far right is steadily growing. Right now, if you can't read that, which I can barely read, is $411,000 in the bank. Um, and so while it seems like a, a lot of money, it can go very quickly, especially should we hire one or two full-time people, one maybe doing grant writing or whatever happens next. But the, uh, the board is going to be meeting and guiding and discussing our moving forward how we, how we scale, really. So. Um, 
yeah, this available, if anyone is interested in seeing it close up, it's available for anyone to see, and that's, that's it. Any questions about money stuff? What is our age of funds in the sense that if all of our income stopped tonight, how long would we last on the funds that we currently have banked? And how quickly are we turning over just in general? Sorry, I'm an economist. Our main income is monthly subscriptions. It just can't end. It's not possible. I mean, if it were okay. if it were to end, our general monthly expenses are somewhere in the range of sixteen to twenty thousand, okay. generally speaking. And so, what is that? Twenty four four hundred divided by twenty. Quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit more than I was so yeah. So for the moment, but like I said, we're mostly based on volunteers. And so, when it comes to hiring contractors, paying for more fiber leases, all of those are pretty high. Become high overhead or capital expenses. I have one right here, actually. Um, uh, well, one thing I wanted to add is that um, the, the board doesn't really decide on things. It, the, the, the discussion happens on Slack or, or in groups. So, you know, whether we do the affordable connectivity, it, it, the, those discussions will happen on Slack. And, um, and then once there's a, a sort of consensus, then that's put to the board, and the board will, will either say yes or no. Um, so, Zach, uh, will I get your presentation up? I had a question or a comment about this. I had a question or a comment about this um, with respect to how long we can last. And I think there's how long we can last, but there's also um, having enough cash to be able to do a giant project, right? And so something like the Belmont Cove, we could easily spend a couple hundred thousand dollars doing that, and they'll pay us back, but we have to have enough cash to be able to do it. And, and there, of course, we can ask for 50% down and so on, but we're even talking about, as Brian mentioned, doing fiber leases to different places to really improve the quality of the mesh, and that, that will increase our monthly expenses. Because if we're, if we're positive five grand a month, you know, we should strive towards spending that on making the mesh better, right? So we have, and we've been talking about several fiber leases and so forth. So we, it looks like a lot, but it's not as much as you might think because we could easily spend, you know, like we just, it says right there, spent 17 grand on upgrades, you know, we could do that two or three more times on accident, right? Or like on purpose, but, or, you know, all the light beams we just bought, et cetera. Right? So. Yeah. so we, Will I get your presentation up, Zach? Yeah, sure. OK. All right, so. OK. All right, so I'm Zach. Um, as I mentioned, I'm with The Mesh for a while. And um, there's a, a number of projects that I do for The Mesh. Uh, so this kind of presentation I don't like doing. I don't like talking about myself or what I do. And uh, we were looking for something that um, to talk about an extra presentation. And uh, there's a number of projects that I kind of said I would do or committed to. And um, some of them have been going on for a while, so they deserve an update. So I'm, that's why I'm here to give this kind of update. So actually, that's what I just said. So it's a good thing that I, it's a good thing that I wrote the presentation. It means that I, I at least um, do the same thing twice. So um, Anyway, a lot of these projects are things that are really kind of a one-person project, or they start out that way, and they create infrastructure that more than one person can work on, at least that's the hope. And so um, we'll, we'll go through some of them right now and the status update of them with the idea that, you know, I'm working on them, but they're not my projects, they're the Mesh's projects, right? Uh, the first one, uh, we talked about this a couple times, that we're doing a server and router refresh. This is that item that was $17,000, I think, right, a couple of months ago. Um, this is to replace all of our SuperNode routers, some of which are 10, 15 years old. There's a presentation in November you can look at about this. Um, and we're getting pieces slowly in on this. The last piece just came in. 
Um, and then there's one more, the second to last piece that is, there's one more piece. There's a discussion in the architecture channel about if we should answer this question here about if we should spend another $4,000 to put us up to the next level beyond with this hardware before we even uh, go out, right? So I think yes, but anyway, um, that's one thing. And like, here's an example, here's a picture of that hardware right now. Um, this is the test bed. This is uh, two days ago, I think. Um, in the middle, you can see we have uh, four by 100 gigabit into one of our servers here. They go down to two giant test beds in the bottom. And then we have a quad by 40 gig feeding between the test side A and the test side B. So we can test um, quad 40 gig or four by 100 to see if either one is faster. And with the new cards that I suggest buying, we can, uh, we can hit line rate on both of those. So this is the new infrastructure, the new hardware that's sitting there that will um, you know, this router is on top. We use these in production right now as well. The same exact model, they're donated. Um, the servers be below we bought. And so um, that's one project that's ongoing and I think pretty exciting for us. Uh, the, the next project are these community room computers over here. I, I'm not the only one that worked on this, but um, they're here. That took some time. Um, there's an interesting thing that if you, if you use these computers, they, they're okay, but they have a, a, a password called kiosk, and they have, like, you can save files to them, and it's not the best, right? It's not like a classroom laboratory computer. Um, and so I'm working on, with a couple other people who actually aren't in the mesh, making a really um, kiosk version of Linux that just opens up, and it just refreshes when you're, when you're done and uh, throws everything away so it's super safe to be able to, to use. Um, the picture here is actually that copy of Linux running, and the, the bar on the bottom is a little bit off right now. It's not quite what we want, but there were some comments about it's, it doesn't look the way people want it to look, so working on making that better. Um, and speaking about the previous two things, actually, um, both of those have to do with, uh, with Linux and making Linux usable for us in a, a certain way. And so I'm looking a lot into um, Nix OS and reproducible infrastructure. And I hate to say it because I'm not really a big fan of Nix OS, but it does, it's a copy of Linux that lets you make reproducible builds. And so um, th the new Supernode 1 computer that I just put in uh, on Sunday, um, it actually uses this already. So our Supernode 1 computer, the new router, which replaced, I think it's the next one. I accidentally removed that, so there's another one. We replaced uh, the Supernode 1 router on last Saturday, um, no, Sunday. Um, I'll just talk about that briefly because there's, if you remember, if anyone was looking at a presentation from some time ago, there's one computer at Supernode 1 that's been up for about 2,400 days. It hasn't restarted, it hasn't lost the power supply, it's been running there for about almost seven years. And uh, it's really scary. Um, so uh, the fiber connection to that stopped working. And the question is, is it the computer or is it something else? And I happen to have one of the spare computers for the mesh around. Um, and the spare computer was faster than the 15-year-old computer. So I replaced it last Sunday. Um, surprise, it's not us. It's someone else. So. Uh, the fiber is still down because it actually wasn't the router that was up for 2,400 days. So it's still good. Um, we can still use it. But anyway, it's using this new reproducible version of Linux. And so that router is something we should be able to rebuild uh, over and over again. And I'd like to, to redo a lot of our infrastructure in that way. I'd like to make it so we can do uh, a, a pull request, um, you know, a JSON file that has our peering, our DNS, our NAT, configuration like this so that we can build things in a very uh, easy way and we can rebuild them and people can participate on that. Um, we're also refreshing the metrics. Uh, I'm working on this with Olivier. I'm a little bit behind in, in um, getting him some pieces, but working on combining a couple of the different parts um, so that we can, uh, we can do this. I think other people may also be uh, doing their own efforts on this as well, but we're, um, that's a thing that's important, I think, for the whole mesh. Um, and working on fiber to different places. As, as Brian mentioned, one of our buildings was canceled, so um, I spent some time with the vendor on that. Um, there's a second Bronx location that I'm not sure is canceled, and then I'm, I'm in discussion with the vendor about um, the other one, as well as uh, two additional connections that um, 
should add some redundancy and some bandwidth to our network. So that's kind of, uh, so basically upgrading our core network as well in addition to the hardware. Um, there's also some BGP repairs at Brooklyn that I'm working on, and, and that's it. You know, so there's more things, but um, those are the things that are of, of, of interest. And um, like I said, I, I don't want, I'm not really desiring to make a presentation about myself, but this should encourage you to maybe talk about, present, about projects that you're working on the mesh. Um, I know there's a bunch of different people working on different buildings, uh, different software components. Um, and so I think this is a great time to fill uh, talking about your different projects you're working on. Um, so I'd encourage you to do the same. Thanks. That's it. Yep. Any, uh, any questions or anything like that? Yeah. Any questions? Cool. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, I don't know if I need a mic for this, but I was wondering if there is a version of the um, Linux OS that you're working with that, like, um, we can test, like, is it something that you want people playing with and, and like, chiming in on or anything like that, or? Yeah, it, it will be released. It's just, okay. it's not, um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually thinking about booting it at one of these tonight as a test just to see if it works on, on that hardware, but the idea is it, after I make the GUI slightly better, then I would release it and people could iterate saying, you know, here's a, here's a better version of it, right? So, yeah, I think it just has to be feature complete first. Cool. Um, you know, it's very close to that. Um, it's just, do I spend my time on VPP and routers or replacing a Supernode 1 that's down or that? So, yeah. But yes, you will definitely get a copy. Um, look in probably software firmware. That's where I'll probably post it. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Okay, thanks. Who's next, Brian? Um, that's it, I think. Okay, all right. Thanks, everybody. Anyone else want to present? Okay. So, um, yeah, we'll just uh, break out for discussions. Um, I, I've got some beer, and I might order some pizza as well. Okay, break out for discussions. Thanks, everybody online. So one of the things that I've worked on at the Internet Society for several years, and one of our focuses at the Internet Society is on promoting and defending encryption. Encryption is really a key tool to securing the Internet. It secures privacy on the Internet, secures our information on the Internet. It also makes sure that the information that we send to one another doesn't get changed, provides integrity. It does a lot of very important things for the Internet. Everything from the infrastructure layer, where things like transport layer security are used to protect data as it's in transport, to the things that run on top of the internet, like Signal or WhatsApp or the apps like that, that allow you to have end-to-end -end encrypted communications with one another. At the Internet Society, we see encryption as one of those really important tools for enabling a secure internet in the future. But it's under threat. Around the world, governments and other groups have tried to undermine the use of strong encryption. This isn't really a new thing. There's been governments around the world who've been trying to undermine encryption for the last 25 years. Some of you all might recall in the 90s when there was the clipper chip fiasco where the U.S. government tried to force companies to put a backdoor in their systems so that no one could actually fully secure their data without the U.S. government being able to snoop on them. That is still going on. There are still governments around the world who are trying to undermine encryption. Unfortunately, two of those governments are North America, Canada and the United States. But this is happening all around the world. Back in 2020, the Internet Society made supporting and defending encryption one of its top priorities. And so one of the things we did was we helped develop the Global Encryption Coalition, which is a group of about nearly 400 organizations and companies and academics who all work together to try to defend encryption around the world. Some chapters on this call, I believe, are already members, and some of you have not joined yet, but you're welcome to join. This group has worked with the Internet Society and our membership to push back against threats to encryption where they arise. A good example of this is in Belgium, where a few years ago, 
the Belgian government was trying to undermine strong encryption with a piece of regulation that would have forced companies to put in encryption backdoors so that the government could on demand break into people's communications. And unfortunately, in putting in that backdoor, make it easier for everyone to break into those communications, making everyone less safe. We worked with our chapter in Belgium to push back against that law. They did a campaign with other European chapters and members to push back against that piece of legislation. And because of their work and because of the advocacy that they did, the Belgian government not only stopped trying to pass that law, they actually publicly admitted that what they were trying to do was going to be bad for the internet and bad for security and privacy. And so that's just one example of how chapters have engaged on this. Jumping into the United States and the overall view of where we are with this issue. In the U.S. right now, the Justice Department and some members of Congress have been really pushing for laws that would actually undermine the use of encryption. And I'm going to talk about really two of the laws in the U.S., and then I'm going to jump to Canada and talk a bit about the Canadian landscape. So in the United States, there's two pieces of legislation that are currently being debated in Congress that could have a negative impact on encryption. The first is called the Earn it Act, and then the second is called the Stop CSAM Act. Both of these laws aim to do really good things. They're trying to protect children online from heinous crimes and trying to stop the spread of horrific images of bad things happening to children. But in the way that they're written, they actually would undermine the use of encryption. Um, and here's how this would happen. Both the Earn it Act and the Stop CSAM Act make changes to the liability regime in the United States for internet platforms, service providers, and in the case of the Stop CSAM Act, also software distributors. So a huge swath of the internet basically would find themselves liable either criminally under the Earn it Act or civilly under the Stop CSAM Act for the spread of bad images or illegal content on their platforms. The problem is because they would be able to be found liable, this means that these platforms would be forced to put in some sort of way of trying to monitor the content being sent across their networks. For end-to-end -end encrypted services, it's really strong encryption, there's no way for the provider of the platform to access the contents of those communications without weakening the security for everyone with something like an encryption backdoor. And so we have this situation where we have two pieces of legislation that both are trying to do something really good, but would actually make it so that companies and platforms would be really disincentivized to actually use good security on the internet. They'd actually be incentivized to weaken the security on the internet. So right now, both of those pieces of legislation are in Congress, and there's a lot of work that has been done by the Internet Society and other, other organizations across civil society against those bills and really just trying to raise awareness of how these bills would actually negatively impact encryption and then the security and privacy of the Internet. For instance, the, the Internet Society sent in a letter a few weeks ago to the Senate Judiciary Committee in the United States talking about the concerns that we have about the Stop CSAM Act and those concerns around encryption. And that letter was added to the congressional record by one of the senators, and a few others quoted what we had said. Also, the Earn it Act was the subject of a big letter from organizations and companies that were uh, concerned with the impact of that bill on encryption. And so there's a lot of things that are happening, but there's a lot of opportunities also for more advocacy as well, which I'll jump to at the end of what I'm talking about. Canada is a little bit different in terms of the landscape around encryption. The Canadian government is currently looking at similar legislation to what the United States has been considering with the Stop CSAM Act and the Internet Act, but they're far less along in the process. So the Canadian government is looking at a bill that would be an online safety bill with the idea of how do we protect people online? How do we make sure kids are safe online? And unfortunately, one of the aspects of that will likely be a demand for content moderation and content monitoring. Again, that's something that can't be done with the protections of end-to-end -end encryption. It's just 
physically impossible, it's technically impossible. And so as a result, if Canada also passes legislation like this, that'll be another pressure for, for platforms that use end-to-end -end encryption to have to weaken the security of their services. Um, and that means less security and privacy for everyone who's using it, including kids, including journalists, including LGBTQ individuals who maybe are not out yet and are using end -to end encrypted services to communicate. Also, folks who are reaching out for like helplines for victims of domestic violence. I always talk about how with an end-to-end -end encrypted app, if someone has a phone records, they're not going to be able to see that you sent messages specifically on an end-to-end -end encrypted app to a, a domestic violence helpline. They might be able to see if you call them, if they have access to your phone records, if you're calling from a home phone number or something like that. There's a lot of these people in dangerous situations who rely on end-to-end -end encryption and the security and privacy that it provides. And all that's at risk if legislation like the Internet Act and the Stop CSAM Act in the United States and similar legislation that's yet to come out in Canada passes as well. So not to be dire, but there's a big threat in the United States right now around encryption. The good thing is there's stuff that we can do. We can, as a community, take action to promote encryption, defend encryption. And I'm happy to say that a lot of people on this call, I know already have. For instance, the San Francisco chapter, if folks are on the call from there, have been running encryption trainings, which have been fantastic for spreading the word of how encryption works, why encryption matters. And so thank you for that. Really, it's amazing work. The other thing that you can do is reach out to your representatives. If you have representatives in Congress or in Canada, also in other parts of the region, I know some countries in the Caribbean are also struggling with issues around content moderation and encryption. Reaching out to your elected officials and being a resource for them, explaining how encryption works, why encryption matters, even just explaining it to others in your community is really important. Encryption is amazing, but we don't really recognize it because it's hidden under the surface of all the things that we do. I bet you probably don't realize that if you used a chip credit card today, you've used encryption like five times in one payment. You just don't see it, which is one of the great things about encryption. The bad thing is, if you don't see encryption, you don't know that you need to fight for it because it's out of sight and out of mind. And so making encryption real and making the benefits of encryption real to people in your community is a really important thing. Um, because at the end of the day, sure, we can provide all the expert advice to Congress that we can from the Internet Society. But if you, if you're Americans on the call as constituents, call your representatives and talk to them about this, that goes a lot farther because I don't vote for the representatives from other states or from other districts, and nor does the Internet Society, for instance, and similarly in Canada. So a big thing is raising awareness that we really need. Luckily, there's some ways that we can help you do that if you're interested in doing that. There is a uh, training program that's going to start on let me check the date for that. On July 17th, there's an internet society advocacy training that's starting on our platform around encryption, which is a really great program for learning how to do advocacy, learning some of the lessons learned so that you don't have to learn them the hard way, and learning how you can do that advocacy in your community. The other things that you can do are if your chapter hasn't joined yet, joining the Global Encryption Coalition is a really great step towards doing advocacy. The Global Encryption Coalition is entirely free. There's no cost to join. Also, as a member of the Global Encryption Coalition, you don't actually take any positions or are forced to take any positions on any advocacy activity or even join any advocacy activity unless you want to. The only thing you have to do to join the Global Encryption Coalition as an organization is to agree with the foundational statement, which is that you support strong encryption and are against attempts to undermine it which is a pretty low bar. In joining the Global Encryption Coalition, you'll join a network of around 400 organizations, including ch other ISOC chapters around the world, and can work together to help make local challenges be met with kind of global action. So you can join other chapters as they do advocacy on different issues around the world and vice versa. Also, it's a great way of just keeping up to date on opportunities for advocacy and also 
the threats that are happening around the world. Um, again, free to join and very easy to join. And I'd love to have you all join the Global Encryption Coalition. Ryan, the Global Encryption Coalition, it's only open for organizations, correct? So what are some ways that you can speak or how can you get involved that way if you're an individual? Probably the best way is through your chapter as an organization. But as an individual, we have a Friends of the Global Encryption Coalition list that's more of a one-way list where you'll get updates periodically about things that you can do to protect encryption. Also, you can take the training course and become an encryption advocate. Other things that you can do is just promote these issues on social media. I know that sounds small, but every little bit helps in raising awareness of these issues. The other thing to note on the Global Encryption Coalition is that if your chapter joins the Global Encryption Coalition, you also get an opportunity to apply for grants for Global Encryption Day. Later this year on October 21st, although it might be October 20th because October 21st is a Saturday, there's a Global Encryption Day. It'll be the third annual Global Encryption Day. And this is an opportunity for everyone around the world to come together and make some noise for why encryption matters. Last year, we had, I think, around 80 events, 30 of which were from chapters who used these Global Encryption Day grants to hold activities in their community to support and promote the defense of encryption. People did everything from like a encryption roadshow, which our Nigerian chapter did, uh, to holding trainings, to even our Liberian chapter did a protest and delivered a set of demands to the government about encryption. And so really, there's a lot of opportunities that you can take advantage of. So keep you an eye out on that for October 20th or 21st. That's mainly my pitch here. I'm happy to take questions, talk more about the issues. This was from a really fast like spiel about it all. So happy to go deeper on anything that people have questions on. Take a look at the chat. It looks like the first kind of question, it came from Yuran Cho. What can we do as an organization to advocate for legislation that protects children and vulnerable people online that doesn't compromise encryption? And what can we do to fight for online safety in addition to encryption? Thanks for that question. That's a really important question. And that's a question that we often get from legislators. How are we protecting children online? And how can we do that in a way that doesn't compromise encryption? So to start off, A lot of these issues are societal issues rather than technological issues. They're just magnified by internet, by the social media, et cetera. One thing that we can do to really help without compromising encryption is better training for average people about what is good and bad to do on the internet, when you should raise a flag about content, when you should report something, for instance. At the same time, we also need to have better resources for law enforcement and others to actually take care of reports when they happen. One thing that we see is that a lot of the reports of bad content online or content involving children online, they actually don't lead to prosecution or they're not actually investigated. And a lot of that has to do with just not having resources available. And so One thing that we need to do is have more people looking through the haystack to find these needles rather than having a bigger haystack for people to look through. In terms of what we can do to fight for online safety, in addition to encryption, one key thing is making sure that there's privacy respecting choices that are available for people to make. Also, that there's a better understanding from users around this. I see Christine has a hand because I think she's got some things that she wants to say. Christine's my colleague at the Internet Society. Hi, Ryan. You were going. I didn't want to interrupt you. Yes, but Christine, you have been the online safety guru at the Internet Society. That's not true. (laughs) Hi, everyone. I'm Christine. The other piece I just wanted to add to all of the wonderful things that Ryan said is, of course, that what we're missing from the conversation and often we're missing from conversations about privacy in general, is thinking about the rights of the child and taking a less paternalistic approach to children. Obviously, children at different ages and development need more or less protection and more or less independence and the ability to make their own decisions. But the point too is that uh, children really depend on privacy for their communications 
there are many cases we can think of when children are in abusive relationship situations where they need to seek help in a very confidential and private way. There are other examples of children who are exploring who they are in an unsafe environment or searching out peers. Now, of course, there are great concerns about who children might be talking with, but that's not an issue of encryption. That's an issue of who they're talking to. And one of the most important things, of course, and this is supported by encryption, is being able to authenticate who children are actually speaking to. There are lots of tools out there that parents can and guardians and children themselves, youth, can deploy to provide themselves with greater protection so they don't get contacted by strangers, only by people that they know and trust. And there are many other things like that. Thank, Thank you, Chris. That was great. I just want to give a quick plug to that. Some of the work dealing with online safety has been going on with our online safety SIGs. They've been looking at the parental mm-hmm. overview or oversight of their children and the best practices there. Being a parent myself, this is something that's crucial. And I want to ensure that my daughter has those skills ready uh, if it ever, uh, unfortunately, comes to fruition. But I think it's very important. And thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Sorry, Ryan, back to you. Thank you, everyone, for those insights and for that additional information. I'm with the foundation. <clears throat> My name is Yuri. I'm the director of operations with the philanthropy team over at the ISOC Foundation. And something that I just observed is that there seems to be quite a lot of <clears throat> attention and movement towards protecting the internet. And it would be really wonderful to see an equal amount of energy and resources and attention being directed towards also promoting online safety in a way that doesn't compromise encryption, doesn't compromise the security of the internet or the integrity of the internet. That's just something that I personally, just through my personal observations, I feel like there's a bit of an imbalance. And so I'm just bringing that up as somebody who I don't have children, but it is a concern. I have a young niece and these are things that I'm thinking about. The internet, it can be the wild west at times. And just as an organization, and because there are experts here who would know how to navigate the terrain of legislation and advocacy in a balanced manner, personally, I would just love to see a little bit more attention spent on that other piece of it too, is how do we protect children? How do we protect people from being victims of human trafficking? All of those things. Maybe it's just because it just hasn't been as visible to me, and I'm still here learning about all the different aspects of this organization, but just wanted to share my thoughts and thank you so much for this informative call. Thank you, Yuri, for that interjection. That was lovely. One thing that just came to mind is, Ryan, I believe that was it the GEC that had a game or a way to gamify of what encryption is like and the kind of repercussions of not having strong encryption? Was that through us or was that through the GEC? It was actually through us by way of the Global Encryption Coalition. There was a game that we put out for Global Encryption Day in 2022 and in 2021 two different games that tell the story of someone who is relying on encryption to keep them safe and the choices that they can make as a whistleblower or as a journalist to protect themselves from, in both cases, it was like an evil corporation or some very Hollywood thing from catching them. But trying to make that story of why encryption matters and especially matters to people who are in either minority groups or in in dangerous professions, at-risk communities, why it really matters to them. I see a comment from John about trade-offs with encryption, whether or not it's a societal good. I would come back and say that it definitely is a huge net gain for both the internet and also the people on it. Being able to protect yourself online being able to have private communications, being able to trust that your communications are actually going to end up at the destination that they're supposed to go to unchanged is absolutely critical for not only the function of the internet, but also being able to use the internet to its full potential. If you don't have those building blocks of security, you're not going to have that trust. And you're really not going to have that trust for the people who really benefit the most from the connectivity that the internet provides. The people in communities who might not be able to reach out and have the interactions that they need to have in person, whether they're in persecuted minority groups or 
whether it's just an unsafe environment as someone who's like LGBTQ plus in navigating coming out in a small town in the US somewhere or something like that. Having the trust to be able to use the internet to make those connections and do the things that really the internet is amazing for is only possible with things like strong encryption to provide those assurances that what you're doing is going to be safe and not going to put you in harm's way. I have a question I'd like to pose. If there's anyone from our members in the Caribbean, can anyone talk about what's going on in, in your part of the world? And, and is it identical to what's going on in the US and Canada or is it completely different? Anyone have any thoughts there or would like to say something just out of curiosity? I guess we have some shy individuals, not a problem. I'd like to ask Ryan, so besides the Global Encryption Coalition, where by joining or as a chapter joining or your organization joining, you can sign on to letters. Are there any other means that like letter writing campaigns that there are opportunities for individuals to write letters to their senator or their governmental heads to promote the positive use of encryption? Sure. Yeah. So there's actually one really great resource that's out there. We don't have our own version of this because it's, why not? It's best not to duplicate efforts, but the Electronic Frontier Foundation EF, has a, let me pull it up, an action page that has a whole bunch of opportunities for individuals to take action, specifically on the Stop CSAM Act and the Internet Act in the United States. I'm not sure if they have ones for other parts of the world right now. There's other ones for the UK, from UK organizations and things like that. But for the US, EF, their page is great for having a really simple way for you to contact your representative if you're interested in doing that, and also learning more about the issues at hand with each of these pieces of legislation. And so I highly recommend checking that out. And if you're interested in sending a letter or calling your congressman, that would be really awesome for raising awareness of this issue. Ryan, I see another question previously from as far the apologies if I said that incorrectly. How about other tech options like biometrics, which can serve as complementary to encryption? How do you see that? Having more security is all about layers and having more layers to, to, for your security is always a good thing. And having things like two-factor verification or more factor verification is a really helpful thing for protecting yourself. Because encryption is only as good as your password is. If someone can guess your password, it does not matter how well encrypted your your system is because they're in. They have the key then to get into your system. So having a good password and when you can, doing two-factor verification is a really important thing for protecting.